Today I'm going to talk about the process I use to make what I call my $20 bowls. Uh, those of y'all that follow me a lot know that I work a lot of art markets and farmers markets to subsidize this channel. And in those markets, yes, I have a lot of expensive stuff. The $100, $200, $300 bowls and containers and stuff like that. But that isn't the kind of impulse bias most people are looking for when they go to these kinds of markets. And so having something in this price range offers you a lot of ability to sell stuff. But to get into this price range, there's one thing you need to take away. Your labor. The material is free, so if you don't have to spend too much time on these items, you can make a little bit of money. You're not going to make a lot of money on this one, but a lot of times it's enough to turn a bad market into a decent market or make something sure that you don't lose money. Uh, having something that is an impulse buy it's just a necessity if you're going to do this and for even a part-time income. So, what I have right here are blanks that come from the offsides, the quarter sawn size, when I section out a bowl. Now, this kind of material is prime wood, and if I had a lot of storage space, I would set this aside for five, six, seven years to dry out. But that's a long time. Personally, I'm in a situation where I'd rather get the cash out of it. So, what I'm talking about are these are the, some of the best pieces of wood in a log. You have the pith in the center, and when you make bowl blanks and stuff like that, basically you cut out the pith, because that's where all your cracks start. And then I will section that off, and that gives me these sections right here, which are prime wood for making vases or ingrain boxes or all that kind of stuff. But if you want to just turn them into something you, sell, you can sell quickly, that's what I'm talking about here today in these $20 bowls. Now I make these kinds of bowls when I have a situation where there's efficiency of quantity. I can do a small production run where certain steps are the same on all of them even though each bowl is going to be slightly different. Right now I've just finished out processing a tree. Uh, I've roughed out all the other stuff and these are the stuff that I set aside that's already cracking everything but I can get these $20 items out of them. Uh, and I will probably be able to make a dozen bowls out of this little pack or more depending on how bad the cracking is. Other times I do this kind of setup is when I'm coring stuff. I'm getting two, three, four bowls out of something. I've always found that the center sections you know, you could spend a lot of time making them really nice, but when people see something the size of a cereal bowl, they don't tend to spend a hundred bucks on that one. That's some, There's something to the mass quantity. Uh, they pay for wood by the pound a lot of times. Bad, bad analogy, but that's what real life is like. So in those kind of situations, a lot of times I will take that center core section, which isn't very big, I'll set them aside, and when I get about six of them, I'll batch out a whole bunch of bowls. I'll spend maybe a, a morning doing that one, and there we go. On to the market, let's sell them, and move on. So, what's the first step in doing this? We've got to make some squares. Now, if you're going to do any kind of production work on a lathe, you're going to find that bandsaw is just a necessity. It allows you to do so much work quickly. It gets all the roughing done. Pretty much all my wood turning starts out with a bandsaw because I feel it's a fairly safe way to get rid of the bulk. What I have right here is just a standard uh, Delta knockoff by Jet of a 14 inch lathe with a riser block. And the distance makes it nice for me to do the very large bowls, the maximum size I can handle on this lathe. And whenever I get a new bandsaw or I set one up for a friend or something like that, I will build them a crosscut sled. And that sounds kind of weird for a bandsaw, but it makes the kind of work I'm doing right now so much safer. You don't have to kind of hold it and go across with the blade. You can just let this sit right here. You could even let go of it, though I don't recommend that, because all the force is going down and it's fairly stable. Now, what we're doing right now is we're taking all these blocks that I have, and I'm going to cut the end off to make sure that there's no cracking involved. Just cut about an inch off. And then I will cut little squares out as much as I can, stack them aside, and when I get all these cut up into squares, we'll move on. But you don't want to cut up any more squares than you can handle the day you're turning or the evening and the next morning. Because they will start to crack on you. Now 
my crosscut stand sled has a stop that stops at the edge of the table so I won't go too far into my waist block and I can actually use my body to move it forward so my hands can control everything. It's just nice and safe that way. Now I come over, I check it, take the off cut, slam it on the ground. If it doesn't break apart, you know you don't have any checks at the end. If it does break apart, cut another inch off, throw it down until it doesn't break off. Just looking at the end, it might look solid, but there might be a microscopic fracture that you can't see. From here, what I typically would do, is I would take the width of these pieces, which are generally pretty consistent, because I've been practicing with my chainsaw to do that, taking it through, fine, I drop my finger over here, and that's gonna be how I square it off. Now, does it have to be a perfect square? Not really, in fact, if you go a little bit rectangle, that's fine. Uh, we're just doing this one to get it prepped to go on the lathe. I ended up with about 20 bowl blanks, small bowl blanks, uh, and ready to rock and roll. The next step is going to be just marking out the centers and drilling a hole ever so slightly smaller than the drive center I'm going to be using. And I wanted to show you something. This board looked totally cracked up, totally worthless. Y'all see the really bad cracks, but the cracks themselves only went in about two inches. So this thing right here, even though it looked horrible, could return a few good bowls. So don't be afraid about at least cutting into a log to see how bad it actually is. All of these are ready to rock and roll, no cracks involved. Okay, there we go. I got about 20 blanks. I took the time to find the center of all the blanks and drilled a 3 8 inch hole that will allow my driver spur to really bite into it, but it will go in fairly easily and it won't come loose. Now, I like using drive centers for this kind of work because I'm trying to save steps. I'm trying to save time. If I'm selling at this price point, that's the key thing. You don't want to spend much time on it. And if I can set my chuck up and not change it, do all one step on all 20 bowls, then change my tools, it just saves a lot. So far, even dawdling around, changing a bandsaw blade, I have maybe 30, 40 minutes involved in this project so far. That's not too bad. Now, don't feel uh, too worried about using something like this as a dry spur, because I see masters do big bowls off of one little spur like this. Now, when I do do this, I like to use the biggest jaws that will fit my piece of wood. So I went and found the smallest piece of wood, got these jaws in, so they'll all sit right there, and it'll give me a good, stable platform. I also like my one-way system. I'm kind of partial to them uh, because they make all these kind of drive spurs, live centers and stuff like that that will fit in the chuck. So once you put the stronghold chuck on the lathe, very rarely do I ever take it off. So here we go. Just let's lock this in. Install my blank. and get to turning. Okay, my first goal is to get the rough outside shape of the of the bowl and to add a tenon. And since the drive screw is going to be the recess of the bowl, this, that's going to be the outside. Now, there are a lot of people out there that would have cut the circle out on the bandsaw. And when I'm doing large stuff, large bowls, that is exactly why I do. But at this size, I don't fe find a time saving for doing that one. Also, there's another thing. I, a lot of people will, when they first turn it, they'll square it off round to make it easier to turn the shape. Another thing, I haven't found that being a time saver. Now, one of the key ways to take saving time when you're turning is to sharpen often. Uh, a keen edge will get you a better, sh better uh, cut. You'll have to do less shaving. You'll be less abusive to you. But 
Sharpening often doesn't mean you need to do stuff to dull your tools quickly. And if you understand bowl turning, basically what in spindle turning, a tree grows up straight. You turn it on its side, you spin it around your axis. In bowl turning, we tend to turn that tree on its side and spin it like this. So, on every revolution, you're cutting straight into end grain right here and right here and long grain right there. End grain is incredibly hard. It will dull your tools fast. So if there's any way you can avoid cutting directly into the end grain, you're not gonna have to sharpen as often. And you can do, it'll be a lot easier for you. So what I tend to do is I just skip the rounding part and I just go straight to shaping. This isn't that big a bowl. Max size, we're going to have little six inch bowls. Most of them are going to be plus or minus five inches. Perfect for cereals, dips, and stuff like that. So here we go. Also on this side, I don't bring my tailstock in. If you want to do that one, you're perfectly fine. I just find it saves me one step and this is pretty secure. Now the tool I'm going to be using for this roughing work is my, uh, the, I think they call it a lathe master. It's a three quarter inch bowl ground gouge. And I use more what they call an Irish grind or uh, well, there are lots of different terms for it. It's nothing new. It's just very swept back. And this allows me to do both a pull and a push, push cut. And because the wings are so swept back, it exposes a lot more blade so I can take a bigger cut. Fewer passes, less time. And I'm not the fastest turner in the world, but if I can speed myself up a little bit, it means more money for me. Now I'm going to be doing what's called a pull cut, meaning I'm going to be using the side of the blade, I'm going to be pulling it in towards me. It exposes a lot of the blade and it does, uh, it works tend to, it tends to work quicker when you're just doing roughing passes. This is not going to be a smooth cut, but we're trying to remove, once again, we're trying to remove stuff quickly. Uh, I know there are a lot of people that get into wood turning that you want to take the time and you want to make every cut your best cut. That way over the course of a bowl turning you get better and better and better and that last final cut is perfect. We're not at that spot. We just want to get it to shape and only concern ourselves on the best cut on our last cut. And the pull cut just seems to be doing a lot better. Now I'm going to go into a lot more discussion on grain direction when we get to that final cut. But for now, I want you to notice I'm going to be pulling from the center out. And in effect, three-fourths of the time, this will allow me to go with the grain. So let me grab my face shield because when you are doing a pull cut, all the shavings are coming right at you. Uh, and we'll get going. Okay, one last point, I am wearing gloves. So all you safety police out there, you know, go ahead and leave your comments. Never use gloves around power tools, but I can almost guarantee y'all have never turned green wood, at least very much, because green wood has water in it. We are generating friction with the cutting that generates steam right on your hand, shavings coming on your steam. You will burn yourself if you're doing a lot of work this way. Uh, if you don't have some kind of protection and these are tight fitting gloves even if they they're not going to really snag i'm back here it's i understand the risk i would rather burn myself than satisfy safety police trolls on people that don't know what they're talking about so here we go come up spin it make sure it's okay i put it in low gear on my lathe because it's not a very powerful lathe come over spin it up slowly spin it as fast as you feel comfortable the faster you spin it, the more work you can get done, the smoother cut you'll do. And when you're turning air like this, it will actually be smoother operation and less abrasive for you. I generally would turn it fast enough so that my lathe doesn't dance. Starting at the corner and start roughing out your shape. Notice I'm using my entire body. Thank you, big shaving.
Okay, so I now got my rough shape of the bowl. Now, what am I looking for in shapes? Let's go to the whiteboard and I'll talk about that. Okay, we aren't making artwork here. This is craft. We're just making, mass producing some attractive looking bowls that are actually going to be used. And a general design theory is if you have any kind of circle or oval, so if you have a perfect circle, or a, a kind of an oval, or even an oval like that, okay? If you take any portion of that circle, it should be a nice, pleasing shape for a bowl. With a perfect circle, if I cut it in half and then take off the bottom third for the foot, I have a pleasing looking bowl. I do the same thing for a long flat oval. I have a pleasing looking bowl. I do the same thing at any level on this and I have a pleasing looking shape. So when I'm doing the rough shape, I'm actually picturing portions of a balloon, the top portion, not the part you tie, the round portion of the balloon to get the shape I want for this rough bowl. And I'm not making the shape perfectly, I'm just getting it roughed out right now. Uh, getting it perfect at this point in stage is kind of a waste of time because you're going to have to go back and clean it up once you put, the, uh, put it on the tenon. So ask yourself, at this point in time, how much time have we actually put into this bowl blank? I mean, drilling the holes, all that kind of stuff, that was about 30, 45 minutes. And this process right now, if it's two minutes at the max, I would be surprised. Taking those rough cuts, maybe six passes to get the general shape, cut in this size, measure your tenon, square it off, pull it out. Time to go grab the other 19 of these and just do the same exact thing. Get it to a bowl blank shape. We've got 20 bowl blanks, no cracks on the outside, most everything is some kind of a balloon shape. I know it's tempting to add a little texture or something like that, but stick with the balloon shape because it'll allow you to get a very thin bowl all the way down. It might be a tad bit thicker right here, but not enough to make a difference. If you start doing odd shapes or something like that, the interior scoop is not going to match the exterior, and then you'll have a thicker part of the bowl than uh, other parts, and you might get cracked. Because remember, these are green bowls. We're not wanting to spend time drying them, returning them, resanding them, all the other stuff. We're just batching stuff out, and if it warps, it warps. No big deal. Now, uh, I'm, the next step is I'm going to change over my chuck to the setup on this, put smaller jaws on it, and then we're going to start hollowing them out. Uh, excuse me. First, we'll finish the shape on the outside. If we're going to do sanding, we'll do sanding then, and then we'll start hollowing it out. It is a little after 5 o'clock now. I want to say I started this right around 2 o'clock, uh, maybe 1.30. But I've had a lot of distractions today. I produced a video for Instagram, one of my uh, woodworking tips of the day. Hey, check it out. I try and do those at least once a day during the weekdays. Uh, and I've answered a bunch of emails and stuff like that. 
Uh, I did time me for that Instagram video and it took me about two and a half minutes to go from loading it on the chuck to pulling it off. So that tells you about how much time it would take you uh, if you just got after it, maybe an hour to do all of these. So let's get to hollowing it out. So the next step of the process is to finish shaping the outside of the bolt. And this will be the last time we touch the outside until you add finish, which for my particular purpose is milk paint. So let's make a little bit more of a mess. Okay, I just finished a push cut to get my shape. I generally like to do my shaping with a push cut, but this was going against the grain. And if you notice, I've got a little bit of tear out right there and right there and if you feel it the it looks deceptively smooth but if you feel i've got a little bit of a high spot right there so what i'm about to do is show you a skewed scraping cut in that i'm going to use this bottom wing right here of a freshly sharpened gouge uh, and i'm going to break drop my handle so that it's gonna just scrape at an angle and i'm gonna move the camera so you can see so here's my bottom wing. I'm going to drop my handle so it's going to hit ever so slightly. I'm just going to give it a light touch. And this is the only time in this project that I'm really focusing on getting the best possible cut I can. And if you notice, I'm getting very thin shavings. This is not sawdust, it is shavings. And the better I do here, the less sanding I have to do, if I have to sand it all. My goal is that when I'm in, when I'm done, I'm not gonna have any lines, no shadow lines. And it looks like I'm gonna have one. Okay, let's check it out. Let's see our finish. See, I got some lines right there, and that's probably some tool lines, but I don't seem to have any, maybe a little bit of tear out right there, but I'm going to let that slide. I did one really good pass. Best cut I could do in that pass. Everything else I'm going to let go. So I will reach around. I'll grab a 150 grit random orbital sander pad, and I think that's 150 grit. I'm going to be painting my finish outside, so I'll reverse the direction. Normally when I'm working, I'm not doing this camera, I have a fan blowing behind me to blow all sawdust. But I'm not going to do much sawdusting here. I'm just taking off whatever nibs are left there and whatever lines, shadows for my tool marks. So just one direction, reverse it, go the other direction. Good enough. Oh, and I don't think I mentioned it. After that outside roughing work, I generally will ship, switch to a 3 8 inch gouge. It's still the same Irish grind, uh, and that's what I'll use, except for when I'm doing the very bottom of it. And just lately, I've been switching to what's uh, called a traditional grind. Ah, wrong one. A traditional grind which is more straight across and this is more of a bottom feeder it just does that one cut uh, sometimes I like it sometimes I don't uh, it just depends now it's time to hollow out the interior and I'm going to be basically trying to do it in three steps the first step I'm going to come in from here I'm gonna make V cuts and that's gonna leave a pyramid in the middle from there I'm gonna get rid of the pyramid and then I will try to make one last pass following the outside curve, maybe an eighth of an inch, no more than a quarter of an inch on this size. Preferably down to eighth of an inch and just match the curve from the outside to the end. So real quickly, let's hollow out the interior. And don't be afraid to really crank up the speed at this point. It is a balanced weight. Everything should be just fine. 
So starting in the corner, come down to a little bit more than my desired thickness with one stroke. Come back in about a half inch, three quarters of an inch. Come back in. This is green wood, so it'll cut really easy. Now this is also pecan, which is known as pecan tree because it is so hard, but you'll get the idea. Okay, now to get rid of that center section, I don't know really turn it off but you can see I've got these little pyramids right here and I'm about a quarter of an inch right now here but it starts to swell out about halfway down so all I want to do is get rid of these little pyramids there we go now I'm going to try in one pass to follow the outside now there is a trick to doing this and it's a head bob. If you put your finger out in front of you, if you put your hand in front of it, you can still know where your finger is. And if you move your head, you can see the finger going back and forth. Your finger, you know where exactly where the tip is. Well, you can do the same thing with a bowl. And it's the same thing owls and all the animals do. Why they move their head back and forth. It's to focus on the tip. So if I look at my tip, I can see it here. I can see where it is, but at some point it gets behind the wood. If I just move my head back and forth, I can kind of tell where it is in relation to the edge. And I'm just trying to make it consistent right now. So hopefully with one pass, I can get the shape I want. Oh, and before I do that one, I generally like to shape my rim. Uh, I either do it as a concave going in or a concave going out. Uh, I'll do a concave going in. I'm going to use that lower wing right there just to get it the way I want. It's just a very light cut. Drop the handle so it's nice and skewed. I like it to be slightly rounded. That way when people feel it, it kind of falls in. Okay, there is about a less than eighth of an inch. So if I come in, I put my tooth in here, and one secret is don't take a light cut. Take a good amount of cut, something you can control easily. If you take too light a cut, the tool doesn't want to bite in. Oh, it skipped on me, so I'll redo this. Okay, take a nice bite. And it doesn't take much pressure. Okay, let's see how we did. Now I'll tell you, a lot. you'll see woodworkers put their fingers in all the time. You can't really tell the difference between your fingers if you just touch them together. But if you move, you can tell if they're going apart or coming in. So if I come in here, I can tell I'm beginning to separate right about there on the bowl. About three-fourths of the way down. So right at that spot right there, I'm going to come back in and try and make one more cut to finish it up. I think my depth is just about okay. So, what I come in to do is I run that bevel in. And I might come back a few times to kick up the line. Make my cut. See how I did. Much better transition.
Now the last thing I cutting action I do is I will pick up a scraper. This is not to get a finish. I'm actually pretty happy with that finish. I don't see any tear out whatsoever. Uh, I could put finish right on that one, but it's a shape issue. People are going to run their fingers on the inside, and because I have such a short bevel so I can make the corner on this one, there's a little bit of undulation that you can feel. You can't really see it, but you can feel it. By using the largest scraper I have, that curve right here tends to take away those undulations, so it will feel a little bit nicer. So I will make one pass with the scraper and call it done. There we go. Notice I did not hit the sides with the scraper. It was only the bottom, because for some reason when I transition that bottom, I get those undulations. It might just be me. So here we go. I have a nice smooth curve in here, somewhat even thickness all the way through. I'm going to lightly hit it with sandpaper. 150. Just to remove any high spots on tool marks. On the inside, I will go up to 220. Reverse my speed. Break my edges on the rim. And there we go. I am now done cutting on this board except for removing the tenon. And this is the last step I can do with my lathe in this configuration. So I will do all 20 of these the same way uh, and then come back to you. And I'm probably going to have to take a break right now so I'll, you'll see a different clothes when I come back in because I got prepped for another art show. Uh, so here we go. I'll do as many as we can tonight and then we'll come back tomorrow. Oh, and at this point in time, as you finish them in stages, throw them in a box. And if you can't get to something right here, throw them all into the box and finish them up the next day. The box will kind of slow down the drying process. It will prevent air from moving. And any moisture that escapes will kind of stay here. It's not a great fix, but it's an easy one.
Okay, now with the finishing of the last bowl, it's time to reconfigure our lathe so that we can remove the uh, tenon on the bottom. Now, there are a lot of ways of doing that. You could put those original chucks on, put some tape on it so it won't mar it up, and just press it on. If I'm doing one or two bowls, or if I've done like those six bowls from quarrying and stuff like that, just something to batch out quickly, I might use the tennis ball trick I've shown y'all before, where you just put the tennis ball in there, use the tailstock to squeeze it in, and then you sand off the nib. But with 20 of these going, it makes sense for me to put on the jumbo jaws. And those will just make things a lot easier and for this mass production thing. So, I'm going to change off the jaws and I will show you how to remove the tenon. Now, jumbo jaws operate off the principle that you can squeeze the, your chuck down and these edges, which are little pyramids, um, uh, hopefully you can see that in there, will squeeze down on the rim. This is another reason why I tend to go for these less than half of a hemisphere or balloon designs because if you have it folding over down on the top, the jaws will kind of pinch it out instead of pinching it in. Now, there is something to know. As you use these jaws, you will start to get a little aluminum marks on the top uh, just from them sitting there or rotating around or rattling around or whatever, however they come out. So if you're needing to protect this rim right here, you might consider putting a ring of blue tape on that. And you, that blue tape will, should come up a little bit because sometimes you'll get these little rubber marks. I am going to paint the outside, which a lot of times has a paint coming over this lip. So after I paint it, I just run this edge on some sandpaper to remove it. So I'm not too concerned with it. Another thing is, notice you have a, quite a few of these little things. Having to reposition them for every single bowl takes time, and that's what we're trying to save. So this might make some common sense. Pull out all your bowls and group them by outside diameter size. That way you only have to reset those plastic triangles up once per diameter. Before you chuck it up, this is the last time you have to make any adjust adjustments on thickness, how deep the bowl is. If you missed your thickness right down here and you know it's pretty thick, you can actually eyeball it and make a pencil mark on how much of this bottom section you want to remove. I've got mine pretty close right now, so I'm not going to make that mark. And all I'm going to do is remove the tenon and uh, hollow it out a tad bit. So, chucking up, just put it in between centers. Tighten up the chuck, and it'll stay. Now, if you need to, for comfort's sake, you're more than welcome to bring a till stock up and push it in right there. Warning, don't push too hard, especially if you've done the interior shape okay, because you might not have that much pressure here, and you could shove it in, because you get a lot of torque with that little sharpening wheel. I'm not going to do that one, because it saves me two steps. I don't have to remove that center burr, that center dimple, and I don't have to pull this back and push it forward all the time. And remember, I'm trying to save time here. And I trust that these dovetail little rubber washers and the fact that my bowls flare out ever so slightly will keep it locked in and that all my torque, my pressure of cutting is going into the wood. It's not pulling out. So my goal right now is to recess this uh, center section to the point where it's just under this rim right here and then just smooth everything out. So I will be using two cuts. One will be a push cut pulling in and I tend to go in at a slight angle and the rest will be the scraping cut. Notice I've got a freshly sharpened gouge. You do want to take very light cuts at this stage. You can take a light cut, but a quick cut kind of serves the same purpose. Start in the center, drop the handle to raise it up, and now you're making a skewed cut. Just keep your eye on the side so that you do not go past the base too far. Now, if you're worried about thickness, you can stop the lathe and kind of tap it. If it doesn't feel solid, you know you're getting kind of thin.
and using the back of my gouge I can kind of check it to make sure it is somewhat hollow. There we go. I like that. I personally also like to put a few grooves here and if you understand your bowl it's thinnest there, it's a little thick there so you have a little bit of room. You can use your gouge and it kind of just dresses up the bottom a little bit. And if you sign your bowls, which I typically don't sign these cracked ones, it gives you a spot to sign them in. Hit it with a little 220 to blend it in. Remove any kind of tear out or anything like that. And you're done. So I'm going to do the rest of these minus the montage because they just take too much time to edit. And when we come back, we'll put on the milk paint. So there we go. All the bowls of the tenons off and we are ready for finishing. And my finishing method, I'll show you in a second, is milk paint, oil, and a little bit of wax. But I want us to think about how much time we put into each bowl so far. It didn't take but maybe 30 seconds to a minute to actually cut a square out on each one of them. Uh, I showed you how I shaped the outside and when I timed myself, I think it was like two and a half, three minutes or something like that for the Instagram video. So let's say we've got five minutes in it total. Let's say it took me a whopping five minutes to hollow it out, which is probably closer to three minutes. So we're ten minutes there and fiddling around, changing all the, the lays, setting up the bandsaw. Per video, let's add another five minutes to do that and take off the tenon. So we're up to 15 minutes, which gives us five minutes to slap paint on it twice, sand in between, and put a little oil on it. We're right on track for only putting in about 20 minutes per bowl. And I'm not the fastest turner. Anybody could do this. So the next step, I typically will spend a few seconds on each one of them as I, I walk them from here to my finishing table. Uh, and I will sand any rough spots because this was green wood and just sitting out in between stages, sometimes you find a little bit of kind of fuzz pop up. I'm not sanding away... Um, tear out or anything like that just kind of evening it out now I like using milk paint it's a very easy finish to apply and you can store a lot of it of a bunch of different varieties I typically buy the stuff from the old-fashioned milk paint company uh, and I bought a whole set years ago and then I just replenish what I use and I keep them in these masonry jars most of them have one of those plastic uh, moisture absorbers are in there and I put a little spoon in each one so they don't get mixed up and basically all you do is I typically use a black uh, base color and then I put another color on top of all the stuff I sell this time I'm going to try to mix it with a little snow white to get more of a slate-ish gray color so one tablespoon is really all you need and I have found that if I mix one of these little baby uh, syringes of water with one tablespoon, that's about perfect amount of water. And because it's water-based, this stuff will actually absorb into the top layer of the wood in addition to sitting on top of it. So it just kind of really sticks really well. But as it wears, it looks better and better and better. Now, you will have to apply multiple coats of this stuff. For the simple reason, it is water-based and it doesn't go on like most people think latex stuff do paint does. Uh, but because of that, it just wears incredibly well. Now, because they require two coats, or at least two coats, I would typically put a base coat of a very dark color, a standard color like this black. See, that's kind of like mustard, and we want it just a little bit soupy on this first coat so that it will kind of absorb into the wood. And on the top coat, because this isn't translucent, whatever color you put on, it will be that color, but any any time they scrub on it, wear on it, this black will come through before the wood. And another thing I like is because milk paint mixes with water, that's the color you will get. It's not like another a lot of other paints where you apply it on and it's one color and then after it dries, it's another color. This is the color you're going to get. So if you mix two powders together, 
before you put it on your wood, you will get the color, uh, an actual representation of the color. So you mix it up, let it sit for a minute or two, and then we'll apply it. And I'll show you a few tricks for applying it in a second. Now, all these other colors, I have found that the brighter colors, with the exception of orange, because I'm in Austin, Texas, Longhorns, they don't really sell that well. Having darker colors, base colors, earth tones, seem to do best. Uh, I might even lighten up this Lexington green right here, but I have a barn red, a seafoam green. You wouldn't think driftwood would be a really popular color, but in a bowl, people seem to buy that one, that color a lot. And these are all the standard com colors from the old-fashioned milk paint company. Now, when I mix up the colors, I typically use these small Dixie cups because I'm not mixing up much. Just enough to color, cover the outside of maybe two bowls at max. So I will use about a half, a tea, half of one of these plastic Dixie spoons. And as you can see, that is why buying a, buying a pint of the powder will just last you forever. And because I didn't use a full spoon, I just use about half of this little syringe of water. Mix it up and let it sit. And by the time I apply all the black paint, this will be ready to rock and roll. It also helps out to mix it with warm water. Now I'm using one of these cheap Harbor Freight little brushes right here. Now the key thing to remember though is this is naked wood. Any paint that gets in here, you're not going to get out because it's going to absorb in the top layer. It'd take a lot of sanding geek to get it off. And I don't really want to get any paint on this rim. But the last step before I apply uh, oil is to sand this rim to make it nice and crisp. And we'll get to that one. The idea is when I'm painting, I put one hand underneath it. Then I just rotate it on this hand. When I come to the edges, I just brush off the side so I get the whole part. When I'm done, I'll actually store it on the face side and it'll dry as soon as the water evaporates off. That's another reason why I really like milk paint. The one thing you don't, absolutely don't want to do is leave these little hair bristles in there. Just peel them out and then Right before I'm done, I will walk through, and if there's any bubbles or anything like that, I'll run the brush over them, and it'll pop them out. It'll give me a nice, smooth finish. Also gives me the cool direction I'm looking for with my paintbrushes. Makes it look like pottery. Now, here's what's cool about milk paint. By the time I finish the last one of these, the first one's already dry. So I just grab me one of these little foam sanding pads. I give it a quick once over to knock over the high spots. Oh yeah, and I really like the fact that the grain, the brush strokes just slightly show through. Now you gotta watch out for this powder. You don't want it to get into the pores on the inside. So be careful with your other hand. And then it's just a matter of applying another coat of paint of another color. I'm using the barn red this time. So I will paint this, let it dry, sand it, oil it, and then maybe a day or two later I'll put some paste wax on the outside and the inside and sell it. That's all there is to it. Also, because it's milk paint, it's water-based, I just rinse this brush out with water in the sink between colors. You just want to make sure you get all the pigment out because it will mix with the next color. But reuse the same 50 cent brush for the whole batch. Now we're at my favorite part, oiling them all up. And when you do oil them, I suggest you do all the interior of the bowls first. Uh, that way uh, you won't risk contaminating the interiors with any sawdust or excess pigment that's on the outside of the bowl. And when you do the outsides, I suggest on the very first time that you kind of uh, only use a pa one paper towel per color. I've got six different colors here, so obviously I'll use six different paper towels. 
after the first oiling or shellac or whatever you want to put on it, the color is pretty much set. So you don't have to worry about it after that. I oil these and in a few days I will throw on some uh, paste wax, some beeswax oil mixture, buff that out to high shine and put them on the market and sell them. And most of these are going to be in the $20 range as I said in the title. Uh, these are just good impulse buys and the colors really do bring the crowds in. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Maybe you learned something, if nothing more, how to speed yourself up. Uh, you could do this project like I do it for farmers markets, artist markets, or, you know, in one weekend you could pretty much make everything for your entire Christmas get, uh, list and not spend too much money. Uh, something to think about. And if you did enjoy this video, please like, favorite, subscribe, do all those social medias, tell your friends, and visit our website, worketheffort.com. Uh, I run, I write blog posts, and I have an online store where we sell lots of swag, t-shirts, posters, hats, and a lot of the more expensive artwork uh, I do, uh, we will post there. And all those sales help subsidize this channel. And I want you to remember one last thing. Besides, look at how pretty this milk paint turns out when you oil it. Man, that is nice. Well, I want you to remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.